with Mrs. Vernon Crawford Helen, class of whatever. Let's see, 1985. I was made an honorary. <laughs> That's oh, right, you were. Yeah. And it's conducted by Marilyn Summers on March the 20th, 1996 at Mrs. Crawford's home in Atlanta, Georgia. The subject of the interview is Helen's life and uh, Dr. Vernon Crawford, who was her husband also. Helen, we are delighted to be here today to hear your story. And we want you to begin at the very beginning, okay? All right. I was born in 1921 in Sunshun, S-Y-E-N-C-H-U-N, Korea. I was the daughter and granddaughter of medical missionaries to Korea. As a matter of fact, my grandfather was the private physician of the king of Korea at that when he was a missionary out there. And my father never felt at home anywhere but in Korea, so he chose to follow in his father's footsteps and go back. And I was the first of five daughters, which was a terrible situation in the Orient. After each birth, my father's friends would come up and say, we're so sorry, but the next one is bound to be a boy. <laughs> but after number five came, I think my parents gave up. <laughs> but we are scattered now, as missionary children are wont to do. Uh, I'm in Atlanta, Georgia. I've had recently my sister from Toronto, Canada, visiting me. She left yesterday. And I have a sister who is in Connecticut. Her husband is at Yale. A sister who is in the interior of British Columbia in Canada. Uh, and another sister who is in Vancouver. Four sisters. How long did you actually live in Korea? I was there till I was 17, at which oh. time I left because we had a school for foreign students there. But uh, we left, I left in 1939 to go to college. And I didn't have any grown-ups with me. Bernard was kind of worried about leaving me, that I couldn't take care of myself. And I reminded him that I'd crossed the Pacific when I was only 17 years old, and then the continent. And so that I, I knew I could take care of myself. When you were living in Korea, your family was all there. Did you ever make trips to any other country, or were you exclusively in Korea? Oh, time? no. We visited Japan, and China, Manchuria. Uh, we didn't go around the world ever, but we did. Those were... Where were it, your parents from originally? Where were your parents? My father from? was born in Korea, too, because it, four days after his family arrived in, in Korea, he was born. And they arrived from where, though? From Toronto. Ah, so Canada. originally they were Canadian. Yes. And came there as missionaries. Mm -hmm. You went to the foreign school. Yes. So they treated you as foreigner. Even oh, yes. Your roots were oh, deep. yes. Right. <laughs> was that a privileged education, Helen? I never thought about it as being privileged. It was a very small school. I was in a large class. There were five of us. <laughs> and um, So it was almost like being tutored. Yes. It, uh, so I think in that way it was an advantage that we had individual attention almost. We would have three or four grades in a room. And I had a younger sister. She's the one that lives in Chilliwack, uh, British Columbia who was much smarter than I, and she would be in the same classroom with me. And that was very uh, hard at times, but we always loved each other. Um, so you spent 17 years there. Mm -hmm. That's such a very long time, and you had never been to Canada? Yes, or the there was a furlough in, when I was five years old to Toronto, and I went to kindergarten there, uh, mm -hmm. and then went back to Korea. Did you learn the Korean language? Yes, and I know it's in my head. Uh, because every once in a while I um, speak to a Korean and I can answer the questions that they ask me. Most of the time I can't, I, and I have to tell them in Korean that I've forgotten it all. But uh, That was a very interesting life for you then. Well, I think I was blessed. So how did you make the decision what school you were going to go to when the time came? Well, actually, oh, excuse me, that's the telephone. Shall we just... Well, I didn't make the choice. My mother had friends in Ontario and Canada who thought that a small ladies' college would be much easier transition than to be dumped right into a four-year college. So I went to a little school called Alma College, which was a finishing school. Actually, we were taught manners and all kinds of things like that. Had to practice on Sundays in the drawing room. Uh, it was, did I say it was Alma College? And after that, if I wanted a, four, a degree, I had to transfer to a four-year school. And I uh, applied to two schools in the United States and two in Canada. In the meantime, the war was on and was just running down. 
but all of the foreigners were being evacuated from any place around Japan because it wasn't safe. And so my parents came home, and fortunately, one of the towns that they chose to live in, my father had jobs all over the place because he was restless when he wasn't in the Orient, was in New Brunswick. And one of the colleges I had applied to was in New Brunswick, so I thought I was meant to go there. And I think I was, or I wouldn't have met Vernon. <laughs> and how did that happen? Meeting Vernon? Well, uh, my classmates had all taken physics when they were sophomores. And I couldn't graduate from the school without physics, unfortunately. So I was in a class of engineers. There was one other girl in the class, but she was an engineer too. But fortunately, she volunteered to be my partner. And uh, she <coughs> knew what was going on. She told me what to do. She told me uh, <coughs> what to write in my little book. And everything was just going along fine. And then in November, a new instructor came into the lab, and uh, he started to tell us how he wanted things done around there. And I thought this was a very arrogant person, and I surely would not never like him. Then he sauntered over to where I was seated on my little lab stool, and he said, and where are you from? And I said, I'm from Korea, which I thought was rather interesting. He said, people don't come from there anymore, and walked away. And I hated him instantly. <laughs> and, uh, so however. He was of a very, he told me later that when I walked into the lab that day, he said, that's the girl I'm going to marry, and I've got to make an impression on her. Well, it was the wrong impression <laughs> so far as I was concerned. But anyway, uh, he won me over pretty soon and took me to see his mother. And she said, oh, Miss Morrison. And I, Vernon said, it's, it's not Miss Morrison, mother. Well, wasn't it Miss Morrison you brought last time, mother? And he said, yes, but this is Helen Avison now. So I liked his parents immediately. I started to talk about my trip across the Pacific and how I had talked via radio across the ocean. And my parents had heard me saying that I had arrived safely in San Francisco. This was the 1939 and the San Francisco Fair at Treasure Island was going on. So that's where we made our broadcast. And Vernon's father had heard that broadcast. You know, when war first started, everybody was twiddling his radio dial. And he just happened to have tuned into that particular one and thought that was really quite interesting. And it was you. It was me and some classmates, too, that had so left together. You were dating the professor. Well, he was an instructor. He not had, a professor. No, not yet. <laughs> he, um, had start, he had graduated from Mount Allison in 1939. And then he had taken a year off to earn enough money to go on to his master's work. Uh, and as soon as he got to Dalhousie University, where he did his master's work, he picked up in a routine physical a TB bug and sent him to a sanatorium. And they told him there that he was the worst patient they ever had. <laughs> they wanted to operate right away and all that sort of thing, you know. And he said, I came in here whole, and I'm going to leave whole, too. But uh, he did get out a lot earlier than the other patients. And the doctor told him he could not go back to uh, the kind of uh, rigid work, work that he was doing, or it was a little bit heavy in his master's. So he went back to Mount Allison to be an instructor. And I think he was meant to have the TB, too, or he wouldn't have met me. He wouldn't have. How no. long did he court you? Oh, we got married two years later, the day I graduated from college. My parents had just come back from uh, Korea. And all the worldly goods had been left on the uh, dock in Japan. So they were really poor, and my father didn't have a job, and I couldn't ask them to uh, give me a wedding. So I went to the dean of women one day. Uh, I had a, a diamond ring. His mother, Burns mother, accused him of getting it at five and ten <laughs> because he, she knew he didn't have much more than enough money to get him through that part of his education. Anyway, we were going to get married sometime the next year, and I thought, I can't ask my parents to put on a wedding. So I went to the dean of women, and I said, what would you think if Vernon and I got married the day I graduated? She said, that's the most intelligent idea you've had all year, which isn't, doesn't speak too well for my intelligent ideas. But, and she said, I will give you a reception if you decide to do that. So I told my roommate, and uh, she gave me a shower. Well, things were moving along, and I hadn't consulted Vernon about this at all. I had to call him and say, 
uh, did you know we are getting married May 15th? And he said, well, where do you think we're going to live? You know, Canada was in the war two years before the United States, and Halifax was the only port on the Atlantic side, and it had doubled in population overnight. So I think I'll take another little drink. Anyway, he said, where do you think we're going to live? And I said, well, you have a room? And I guess I could get a room, too. He said, honey, it doesn't work that way. <laughs> So we moved around for a while, <laughs> but we did get married on May 15th, 1943. 1943. <clears throat> mm -hmm. um, what was your degree in? What were you graduating with? Home economics. Oh, it wasn't physics then. <laughs> no, indeed. I had to take a lot of chemistries, but I found chemistry a lot easier than physics. And he had been a physics instructor, so. Yes, and he did all his degrees in physics. Did you plan to work? And did yes. You work? Well, I planned to work, and I worked for a short while, but I, our first baby was born nine months minus a day after oh we got married. So, so um, I had to stop soon. And we lived in a house with another family. We had two rooms. We shared the bathroom. We had two burners to cook on, but not an oven. And we bought our water from their kitchen into our kitchen to wash dishes and things. So you really knew what a hard time was then. Yes, you yes. Were you happy? Oh, yes, very, very happy. And what was your first baby? She was a girl, and so was number two, a girl. And Vernon had wanted a little boy. But after Lynn came along, he wanted the next one to be a girl, too. So we have Lynn, and your second daughter is? Her name is Del. Del. And she is a poet. Uh -huh. She's oh, published poems. How wonderful. So what happened next with the Crawford family? Well, um, Vernon wanted to go on to his Ph.D. He never could join any of the services because of his tuberculosis mm -hmm. record. But he did the same thing, and he was working <coughs> with degaussing. That's demagnetizing the ships that came in and, and went So he out. was doing <coughs> He was doing Navy work along with Navy personnel, but he didn't wear the uniform. <coughs> but uh, he thought after he'd been at that for two or three years that he, mm -hmm. it was time to start his Ph.D. I did not have any nationality because I was a British subject without nationality. How interesting. And uh, <coughs> I didn't go to Virginia with him because I wouldn't have been allowed to work at that time. So he, was, he moved he to went, Virginia? He moved to Virginia and I stayed with his mother <coughs> and she was working and I kept the house and so on. When you married him, <coughs> you didn't become a Canadian citizen? No. Isn't no, that interesting? Not in Canada. In Canada, they didn't do it yeah. that high. It was very uh, interesting when I first left Korea because I had a Canadian passport. My father had written to the consul in uh, Tokyo and asked him to issue me. And the man didn't ask me any questions. He just sent me a Canadian passport. Then when I got to Canada, and Canada was at war, I was asked questions every time I uh, crossed the border. Where were you born? Where was your father born? Where was your grandfather born? None of them in Canada. And they would say, well, you have no right to a, a Canadian passport. And they'd take me off the train to interrogate me further. Oh, how and scary. And take my money away. It was scary. I was, and I was alone. But I managed. I learned to cry. They didn't <laughs> want to deal with a crying woman. The they pushed me back on the train or the next train. A while, huh? <laughs> right. So I you could turn on the cry. tears. Oh, Helen, that's so precious. <laughs> So Vernon had to go off and leave you, and he went to Virginia to do his postgraduate work? His uh, Ph.D. work. <coughs> mm -hmm. At where? Where did he go? He went to uh, the University of Virginia in Charlottesville. And was this in physics? Yes. Was All of his degrees science? were in physics. Yes. How long was he away? <coughs> Two years, and he came home once in that period because we couldn't afford it, and I didn't know he was coming. He lived with four, three boys from Memphis, and they could not in a rooming house, not in any of the public, I mean, the housing for the university. And they couldn't believe that he was going to go two Christmases without coming home. So they took up a collection and gave him a round trip ticket. And there's a little uh, cartoon in there that they gave him along with this ticket to go home. And his mother knew, but she never told me, but she put me to work. Floors need waxing. You need to <laughs> bake a little more. The holidays are coming and all this. And you had no and idea? I had no that. idea until he walked in that night. Oh, my. What a reunion that must have been. It was. It was wonderful. He hadn't seen the baby in so long. No. <clears throat> oh, my. And she grew a lot. Yes. Both of them did. Uh, Lynn, the older one, was very sensitive. And when he first left, 
I used to haunt the post office, you know, even before I could expect a letter. I'd want one. And one day I'd gone uh, down to the post office and came back with it without any letter. And <coughs> I started to cry at the lunch table. And Lynn said, don't cry, Mommy. She said, I miss Daddy, too. And I thought, you know, for a little girl who was just yeah. three years old, that, that was, was pretty, pretty wonderful. Pretty that she had, I've yeah. never forgotten that. <laughs> Yes. And she still is a very perceptive person. So you really <coughs> had a, a difficult start. It was very well, stressed. it was just part of an adventure. The the part when Vernon was away was stressful. Oh, yeah. Because uh, I missed him children. terribly. Yeah, and right. being with your in-laws. Yeah. Well, that was all right, too. Vernon's father had died by that time. But his mother had moved to Sackville in the town where I had gone to college. Oh, I see. And because her older son was a professor there of physics. <laughs> and uh -huh. so Vernon just did the same thing his brother did. <clears throat> so then what happened next? He uh, well, came back from Virginia? <clears throat> he, yes, after two years. But in the interval, <clears throat> excuse me, <clears throat> he, I mean, he <clears throat> can talk without taking drinks most of the time. <clears throat> That's okay. He had That's called me in February on his birthday, the last year he was there. And he said, what's the temperature today? And I said, it's 29 below. He said, it's 71 here. <laughs> so I thought, well, if I could ever live in a place where it's 71 in February, 100 degrees difference, I would not complain about the heat. And he says he chose Georgia Tech because of its latitude. <laughs> he was tired of hearing me complain about the cold. <clears throat> so that was the first job he took with Yes, Tech? yes. And, and we both loved it immediately. And you came with it. You, you agreed to it without ever seeing it. Though. That's right. Vernon had never seen it either. But the physics department was very small then. The head of the department had a Ph.D. And the year we came, there was one other Ph.D. hired. And there were just these three Ph.D.s in the department. And they were ready to go because uh, the uh, G.I.s were ready to go back to school and they needed to expand. And this was when? 1943. 1943. Mm -hmm. And what did you think when you came to the campus? Oh, I was so happy. I thought life was just beginning. And it really did. Um, we were, Dr. Howie, who was head of the physics department, met us at the old the terminal, the old station, at 7.30 in the morning and took us to our apartment. The Callaway Apartments is where we stayed oh. for 11 years. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> I thought we were like students. As a matter of fact, we were the last faculty there. They wanted it to be for married students. And I, but Vernon was brought up. You don't buy anything till you have the whole month. I said, Vernon, real estate is going up faster than your salary. You better get with it. <clears throat> and our and he said, well, I don't know, it just doesn't seem right. That's, his parents never owned a home. So he didn't know about, he didn't think It wasn't the American it was way. Yeah, it uh, I, right. told, I told him, I said, this isn't the American way to, to live. So, so there you were at Callaway with the two little girls. Yes. And what did you think of your new surroundings? Oh, I was so The first thing I heard after we had been introduced to this apartment where we were going to live, somebody outside yelling to hell with Georgia. And I didn't know about Georgia, but, and I thought, Oh, my, what a thing to say about your state. You know? <laughs> <laughs> and I was really very upset about that, but I sort of kept it to myself, and after a while, I grew to like it. <laughs> you had a lot of traditions to learn about. I did, and it's been a place full of traditions, and Georgia Tech treated us well. So there you were. This was 1943, mm -hmm. and students were coming back. Students were after going. After the war. It was a different campus than it is today. It was, of and of course the Callaway apartments were on the campus. And students, if Vernon gave them a deadline to get a paper in, they could slide them under the door one minute to midnight. At the apartment? <laughs> yes. Oh, my goodness. Uh, so that was fun, and we started entertaining students right away, even in that apartment. We had um, mostly physics students at that time, and then we broadened when we had a larger place to entertain in. What did the little girls think of being raised on a campus? Oh, I think they did. They just took everything as it came along. They, I don't think. Where did they go to school, Helen? They went to Home Park School, which is practically, it's not there anymore. It's been changed into apartments. But uh, it was close. We did not have a car for a long time. You couldn't pay it for a car <laughs> all at once, so, so that's why we didn't have a car. And I didn't words, want... In other words, Dr. Crawford only bought what he could pay for that's cash right. in Maryland. That's right. <laughs> well, he finally broke down about the house here, but 
I cried for that too. <laughs> So you had to have them close by, so they went to school then? They walked to school and walked home. And then when it was time to go to high school, they would normally have gone to, to uh, O'Keefe, which was they could have walked there too from the Callaway Apartments. But I didn't think it would be a very good school for college preparation. Most of the uh, high school graduates there went on to work immediately. And I wanted them to have the competition of students who would be going to uh, college. So they went to Grady, and we took them there every day. But that was all right. So for 11 years you lived there. That's a pretty long it time. It is. It's a very long time. Yeah. <laughs> and then where did you move from there? Was, was it to Here. this house? Yes, yes, oh. yes, to this house. And it met Vernon's requirements. It was close to tech. I count on seven minutes to get to the campus. And it has the full basement. Those two were the only requirements he wanted. <laughs> Wasn't that great? I mean, he never regretted his decision, oh, I'm sure. Oh, no, no. This, he didn't want to move. He didn't even want to move to the chancellor's house. <laughs> you know, because, <laughs> he but, wasn't somebody who was given to quick changes or any kind of changes. Well, in that he respect. went along with it. You know, he was in a number of, uh, um, what, what do you call, deans and, uh, and Presidents all, all kinds of positions. Yes, yes he had a, all kinds of positions, yeah. and he went into all of them. Well, he was almost Tex Renaissance man. He was able to to be a switch hitter, wear the hat of architecture if he needed, or the hat of physics. Or yes, that. he was dean of architecture yeah. one time, yeah. but without any. In the very beginning, though, with his physics classes, um, was he happy as a professor? He loved it, and of course, he had to walk to work every day too. And he would walk over, wondering how he could present this point in a more interesting way and he had time when he was walking but then President Van Leer used to pick him up occasionally and he'd say what are you studying and Vernon would say well I'm on the faculty here oh what faculty member are you and he said I'm in the physics department and he said well where would you like me to drop you off and Vernon said well the physics building would be nice <laughs> And he went through this conversation with Van Leer every time he was picked up. All brand new each time? He, didn't remember. he, he never remembered him. <laughs> but that made a good story. Yeah, it did make a good story. Mm -hmm. He worked under many, many, many presidents. Uh, yes, quite a few. But in the beginning, uh, it was Van Leer that was president. What was yes. Britain when you first got there? No, right at the no. End of his time? No, Britain had... Uh, he wasn't there anyway. Britain Van Leer was there. In 45, and Van Leer came in after that. So it must have well, been. Well, must have been, but I wasn't aware of that. Yeah, yes. Yeah. Did you get taken up in, as a faculty wife? Did you get taken immediately? Into it? I did. wanted to. I just thought it was part of my duty as a faculty wife to join the faculty wives club, and, and I've loved it. So they did have it already. Oh yes. Oh yes. Them. Mrs. Howie, who was the wife of the head of the department, was wonderful about introducing me to the church, to the women's club, and to all kinds of organizations around. She didn't have too many to uh, introduce. There were two of us, Mrs. Wiley and I, that year. Ah, so you felt very welcome? Very. Well, the South is welcoming. That's nice I've loved being in the South. That's nice to mm -hmm. know that. Um, did you get taken up into uh, the routines of going to the football games and things of that Immediately. Sort? We never missed a game, and I haven't changed that. I, after Vernon died, I bought uh, season tickets to everything. And uh, this year, I've got a little more interested in the women's basketball team. But I haven't been able, because of conflicts, to go to all of them. But I am now a booster of the women's <laughs> group. What was the campus like in those days? Well, it was certainly small compared to what it is now. There weren't nearly the buildings, you can tell by the look of the buildings, which belonged to the old campus and which belonged to the new campus. The physics building, I don't know when it was built, but Vernon was uh, associate director of the physics department then which he didn't want to take. He loved teaching. He did love teaching. But he got sucked into that job when Dr. Howie died, too, and he became the head of the department. Uh, during that period, he was uh, made dean of the general college, which he didn't want either. But, oh, interesting. Uh, so he sort of had a, uh, this authority imposed well, on him to do these that's things. That's right. He had a talent for it, but he didn't 
think he did. He missed he teaching. Was, he missed teaching. Did he keep in touch with the students? Oh, yes, always. That didn't make a difference? Mm -mm. No, not a bit. As a matter of fact, when he was acting president in 19... Let's see, when was that? It was in the 60s. Yes, it was. It was after Dr. Harrison had uh, retired. He was acting president. And the first time they took the tea down was when Burnham was acting president. And um, they came to him. They wanted to present Dr. Harrison with the tea. And they said, we're a little bit worried about taking down the tea because uh, we might be electrocuted. <laughs> so Burnham gave them the name of somebody in the uh, service department who could help them with this. And um, Billy Adams, who graduated in 69, I think, he was smaller than any of the others. They called themselves the Group of Seven. Okay. And he was the one that had to climb up and bring it <laughs> down and so on. But they did have it fixed. And Billy says to this day that they always considered Vernon to be the eighth man. <laughs> <laughs> he was such a collaborator. Yeah. Huh? Mm -hmm. uh, when Vernon was acting president, he was always amused at some of the antics of the students. And one night, about 3 o'clock after uh, Senator Russell had died, the phone rang. And it was a man who said he was Mr. Kirby, who was uh, one of Senator Russell's friends. And the governor had asked him to call all the presidents and uh, tell them to close the schools for the next day. And Vernon said, well, Mr. Kirby, would you mind if I checked on this? And he said, no, I don't mind, but why should you? And he said, well, you know, tech students are very ingenious about pulling things like this, and I would really like, to oh, well, all right. Well, he called, and he got the right number, and it was Mr. Kirby's number. He, he didn't know anything about this, oh, so <coughs> classes were held as usual. <laughs> <coughs> the student must have been just absolutely freaking out, wondering if, if Dr. Crawford was going to follow through, <laughs> and he did. Yes, he did. He did. But he, <coughs> he had a very good rapport with the students, did he not? Yes, he did. Um, We've always been close to the student body, and that's another reason we wanted to live nearby, I think. And when we first came here, we didn't have much to put in the basement, and they would like to get off campus and uh, have SGA meetings. And then they asked if we wouldn't feed them afterwards. So we started having them for supper afterwards. I could feed 50 to 70 students down there. I'd set up tables for them. Oh. It's a big basement, and there wasn't anything in there. You but fed? You <clears throat> catered for 70 students? I did. I cooked down there. Good thing you yeah. had a home ec degree, huh? <laughs> I cooked 12 dozen eggs once. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> for breakfast, you know, scrambled them. <clears throat> oh, my goodness. And uh, let's see, what else did we do in that basement? <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, oh, yes. Uh, this was an entree to individuals wanting to come over if they were having a broken love affair or something like that. They just wanted to be able to cry. So you had counseling and, sessions here, huh? Yeah, well, we'd it's listen. That counseling. was about all they wanted. But I did advise sometimes. <clears throat> After Dr. Harrison retired, Dr. Crawford served as acting president right. of Georgia Tech. Mm -hmm. And he had been on the campus a little over 20 years, mm -hmm. and here he was acting president. Had you ever dreamed it was going to come to that? No, but I was never surprised at anything Vernon did. <laughs> he surprised me the first time he spoke to me, and so it, I got used to it. he managed to keep you on edge ever since? So. Well, I wasn't on edge. I just went along with everything that he did, and I, I considered it an honor to help him. And he was wonderful in always giving me credit, and saying that I, I couldn't have done this or that if I hadn't had Helen. So that was, that was very satisfying to me. Did you live in this house when you were acting president? Yes. We and used the, uh, the big house for, de for entertaining. And one time, one of my sisters came down with her four children, and I turned this house over to them, and we went and slept in that house. But for most of the time, <coughs> most of the time we stayed here. Mm -hmm. It would look like we were pushing for it, and we certainly weren't at that time. Um, did you enjoy uh, a knowledge of Dr. Harrison when he was uh, in office? Yes, and as a matter of fact, we haven't ever lost touch with him since he's been back. We, we went to his wife's funeral, which was so sad because it was his fault that she died. She, he was in a car accident, and he made a left-hand turn. There was coming over a hill, a, another car, and it hit them. 
and she died instantly. And he, at the funeral, she was, all, I mean, he was all bruised up and, and looked like he should have died, too. It, it was very sad. He still goes to games over at Tech every once in a while, mm -hmm. so we see him at Georgia Tech functions. And then Dr. Hansen came in. Mm -hmm. And what was he like? For, for he, he and Vernon were sort of of the same age and all, and they got, he asked Vernon to be the vice president for academic affairs at that time. So Vernon was and moved into the Carnegie building. Um, we liked him and we liked his wife. Uh, he divorced her before he left for Purdue, that was, so I felt, I sort of held that against him, but I shouldn't have, I guess. And his wife died shortly after that of cancer. And then after that, <coughs> Dr. Pettit came in. Yes, and we liked him immensely. And Mrs. Pettit and I became very good friends, and we would do things together. She was a wonderful person to have as a model <coughs> of an administrator's wife, and I learned a great deal from her. We always went to tech funerals together, oh, wow. and <coughs> it, she invariably would reach out and take my hand in hers and give it a little squeeze. And to me, that sort of represented the um, pride we felt in tech personnel and the love and so on that we felt on this campus. And uh, I, I, she was awfully good with anybody. You know, the men who worked for her now work for me because when I was in the chancellor's house, uh, I needed help and I told her and they did. And she said, well, I'll tell you who to call. And they just, they loved her, these men, and the day that she left, I went up to say goodbye to her, and they were standing in the doorway with their mops and brooms and things, tears running down their faces. So she was a very gentle person. She was. She was a model for me. I really loved her. She did a lot for Georgia Tech. Oh, Staff and she never did it with any noise about it. She was very quiet in uh, her dealings with everybody, and she would call me and say, Joe is out of town, so I don't have anybody to talk to. So and so, a professor had come with this terribly sad story, you know, and I just think Vernon should know about it. And so Vernon would come to the phone, <coughs> and he would listen to her. <laughs> he knew the case, you know, at that time, but she suffered with anybody who was unhappy. Oh. And um, this man w was just hard to adjust to things. And Joe had had a lot of problems with him, and Vernon knew so about So she was that. a very <coughs> empathetic person. Very. Mm -hmm. That was nice for mm -hmm. Georgia Tech. Um, when Dr. Pettit um, passed away, it was a, a real trauma for Georgia Tech. It was. Uh, that he, mm -hmm. he didn't think he was going to die. He was sure he was going to recover. And I think that was hard on his children, too. Because he expected all this to mm -hmm. be done. Um, during this period of 20-some years, while uh, Vernon was going from um, one academic position and then to administrative <coughs> positions, you were also very involved in other things in the community. You got you were very always interested in the theater, right? And always supported drama tech. Yes, um, do you I still do. <laughs> I still give them money every year. What do you think about the uh, some of the, what did you think about some of the early plays they put on the things they did? Well, they were certainly not so professional as they do now. I love drama tech. I think they put on fun things. You know, yeah. I saw the last one I saw because sometimes they're conflicts was Joseph and his coat, uh, his uh, mini colors or whatever it was, yeah, that's the that, one. something it's like that. Coach. I love that, and they always do a good job. Now, um, just a there, there we go. Mrs. Santa Croce, what is her first name? Mary Nell. Mary Nell was married to one of Vernon's students when we came, and she was teaching uh, drama even then over at Tech. They used to have their um, plays near the robbery. No, not the robbery. What, near, where is that awful varsity. restaurant? The Varsity. Yeah. I think that's the worst food yeah. in the world, but everybody loves it. That's where they had their, <laughs> their first plays. And there, yeah. she really put on sophisticated plays, like oh. um, Greek tragedies and things like that. So she was teaching them something about uh, Greek literature, oh. but uh, Oedipus Rex was one, you know, the blood coming out of their eyes and all that sort of thing. You remember that? Yes, I do remember that. Uh, but we've continued to... It's the like longest them. running theater company in the city of Atlanta. Is it? I didn't know that. Well, they're doing better all the time. 
I think they're doing a wonderful job. What a distinction for Georgia Tech to yes. have the longest continuing yes. running theory. Yes. And then we, Vernon and I, were accustomed to having Gilbert and Sullivan Productions uh, at the college where we met Mount Allison. They put on a Gilbert and Sullivan uh, play or operetta every spring. So we became uh, addicted to that a particular kind of performance at that stage. And when we came here, we missed it. So very soon we heard that there was an organization and they were operating out at Emory. Well, we never got to any of those. They have moved around. They moved to the to one of the theaters, center stage it was, on Peachtree Street. And that was a very poor uh, place to go because the steps were uneven and it was awkward. And then Vernon suggested they come to the Georgia Tech Theater and they have loved that. And that's where the... And that group is the Atlanta Savvy Arts. Right? That's right, that's right. And uh, they dedicated the Mikado to me this year and gave me... Oh. A, I didn't know it at all. I was in charge. The Women's Club was trying to interest their membership in the Savoy Arts. And uh, so I was the uh, chairman for food that night and I didn't know anything about this. And when I got in, um, Lee Suttis was sitting next to me and she said, did you know this is being dedicated to you? And I said, what do you mean? She showed me in the program. I said, <laughs> so I was really surprised. What a great honor. <coughs> it but, was a great honor. Well deserved for all well, the support you've given them over the years. It was Vernon who worked with them. I, I supported them, but I didn't work with them as he did. I reaped many advantages and honors through being married to Vernon. What was it like to be the chancellor's wife? What, what happened fun. when that happened? I loved was it, it. Fun? Yes, I really loved it. Um, Vernon was sitting in his office after Dr. Uh, what was his name, the previous chancellor, had left. And uh, we had a Chinese student live with us one year. We told him we only had daughters and we needed a son, so we call him our son now. He said, I'll be your number one son, Dr. C.S. Kiong. Maybe you've heard of him. Of over. course we have. <clears throat> well, anyway, so he was uh, a little early to a meeting in Vernon's office and said, who's going to be the acting chancellor? And Vernon said, I don't know, but I've been sitting by the telephone for days. <laughs> <laughs> and then the meeting got uh, going and Vernon's secretary came in and said, the governor wants to speak to you. <laughs> the telephone had rung <laughs> and um, they wanted him to be acting chancellor. <clears throat> And he kept saying to me, I don't want to be even acting chancellor. I just want to stay where I am. He loved Georgia Tech. And uh, however, he hadn't been in it very long when he said, I made a mistake. He told them, on condition that you don't consider me, I will take the acting job. And that suited them just fine. <laughs> so after we'd been going around the state, we visited every campus um, several times. And it was fun for both of us. We got to know the different campuses and the personnel, the deans and all. And <clears throat> he said, I made a mistake. I'm really enjoying this job. And uh, so we kept on going to meetings and all. And they were to make the selection when we were at South Georgia College in Douglas. And there were reporters all around and all. And Vernon whispered to me when we were going up to a dinner one night, I'm the one and I'm glad, and I said, I am too. But of course, it wasn't supposed to be known yet. So I had to keep <laughs> the lid on until it was officially announced. And you did talk him into moving into the chancellor's home? Well, I couldn't entertain the way I should in this house. And uh, even when he was acting was president, we did our entertaining yeah, over there. That was your ace in the hole. That yes, that's right. And uh, it was really fun entertaining. We entertained not only all the presidents, but all the deans. Uh, the uh, SAC group, the uh, Student Advisory Council, came up once a year, and they always came to our house for, for a meal while they were here. Those were student presidents from all the right. student government associations, and they usually brought uh, the vice president and their dean of students. So we had quite a crowd. They'd eat even in the bedrooms <laughs> so, and in the basement and all, but nobody seemed to mind. But you absolutely enjoyed being a host all the time. It was fun. I really did. Um, Georgia Tech had quite a few uh, student meetings at our house, too. Um, 
Did you have trouble adjusting to living in a different house after having been here no, for a long time? No, it needed a lot of work. When uh -huh. we, and so they let me do nearly all of it. And I, I said, I'll use my own furniture, but let me choose the colors. And they needed to change the plumbing and things like that. Uh -huh. So while they were at it, they might as well paint some walls and things like that. So you were there for renovations then? Well, we didn't move until the renovations were finished. Uh -huh. And so we were here for about a year. After, mm, I don't know. But anyway, it was uh, not too long a period, and this was the first time I'd done decorating without consulting Vernon, and he'd always say, oh, you wouldn't want that. <laughs> well, I had a red room. I didn't consult him about it, but I had a red room there. I knew if I asked him, he'd say, oh, you wouldn't want a red room, and that was the room that got most of the attention when people went through it. Uh -huh. And I also invited all the women's clubs from around the state to come if they wanted to and they came from as far away as Valdosta and then they did, did their Christmas shopping while they were here. Helen, you've always been a champion of the women's and making yeah. sure the women's students at Georgia Tech got a fair shake. Mm -hmm. You were there when the women's students came to Georgia I was. Tech. Do you remember that period of time? Yes, of indeed. The and the girls needed support at that time. There were all kind of classrooms that had no ladies' rooms in them. And, and they needed somebody to talk to. So a group was formed. I really don't know what I represented, but uh, there were Dean um, Chateau, who is now president of Berry College. She was a dean, and I am then. Uh, there were women administrators and representatives of the faculty there, and me. And I think they asked me, so <laughs> the word would get back to Vernon, that uh, things were not the way they should be. We've heard that there were even some professors that wouldn't let the women in their classroom. Oh, they were mean to them. It was just terrible at first. It, it was hard to be a woman student. Why is change always so difficult, huh? I don't know, but people cling to the way things always were. The students didn't seem to mind. The no. male students, they seemed to be no. glad to have, but it was just making yeah. everyone else adjust. They used to date Agnes Scott girls all the time. But, uh, now, you were there when the um, integration process took. Yes. took how, how did you observe uh, that as working? Very smoothly. Most of the people at Tech wanted it to come anyway. And so when they had to do it, it was easy. It was easy. So that, that wasn't a problem. Did you ever know Mrs. Van Leer? Yes, I did. And I admired her immensely. She, she had been an officer's wife. And she got a lot of training there. Uh, Colonel Van Leer, he was, um, yeah. and a lot of people still called him Colonel Van Leer. And she told me that her mother told her she must never look tired. And I thought, what good advice, but how do you do it? <laughs> you know, <laughs> because she was a very active president's wife. She entertained faculty a great deal. And it, it was fun. That's how I met other faculty and other uh, wives. She would um, always went to the meetings, and when uh, Colonel Van Leer died, she still wanted to be a part of things at Tech, so I would take her to uh, Georgia Tech Women's Club meetings. And uh, what was her first name? Do you remember? No, I always called her Mrs. Van Leer. Yeah, she just sort of yeah, was. She was Mrs. Van Leer. Yes, she. Uh, I don't know. She had uh, uh, quite an influence on the construction of the president's home. Oh yes, she planned it. And knew what she was doing. Well, I don't know. It wasn't a very good place when the tech uh, population grew. The, you never could find a path to go through without people bumping into each other. Uh, but it was her house, and she did plan it. She had a lot to do with it. But then she was doing it at a different time in tech's history. So it was probably quite adequate. Um, we're, we're told by women, early women students, that she was a great supporter of yes. them being there. She was. She was. She started the first uh, sorority, and uh, the girls loved her and admired her. It was nice to have a champion. Yeah, uh, not that we meant to digress, but I just thought we'd better bring up about her. Now let's go back to being the chancellor's wife. Uh, how many years did you live in that home? Five years. He, he was uh, chancellor actually six years, but. Uh, we couldn't get into the house until certain things were done. So, but we just traveled during that period around the state, pretty much. Do you look back at it as a happy time too? Very, yes. I loved his staff. Uh, there were a few women there that he loved to tease. Do you know Mary Ann Hickman? <coughs> she uh, <coughs> was very uh, pro-women, 
and pro women's lib. And one day Vernon lost a button on a jacket, and his secretary said, "Let me sew it on." And he said, "No, I'm going to ask Mary Ann to come and sew it on." <laughs> so she called and she said, "The chancellor needs you, Dr. Hickman, in a hurry." So she came up with a cup of coffee in her hand, and he said, "Mary Ann." I've uh, <clears throat> lost a button on my jacket. I wonder if you would saw it. She said, shall I sh throw this cup of coffee at you first? <laughs> <laughs> she knew she was being put yes, on. Yes, they get it together a lot. Mm -hmm. um, there were happy times. You made lots of good friends, didn't oh, you? Oh, yes. Our friends are our greatest riches. And I'm just blessed. I was just showered with kindness after Vernon died. Um, Helen, during the period of time, uh, all this period of time, after once you left Korea, did you ever yearn to go back? Did you miss it? Yes, I did, and I dreamed about it. You <coughs> did? Uh, a lot. Uh, when and was the first <coughs> time you had an opportunity to go back? What when Vernon went back for the Georgia Tech group. Uh, Which was when? Oh, I don't remember, but it was a long time ago. People from the station, we called the um, research complex mm -hmm. the station in those days, they were going, and we had some kind of a cooperative arrangement with some countries, some universities in the Far East. And Korea was to be the next to last stop. And I said, oh, Vernon, and they were going to be two weeks there. I said, I just can't bear for you to go without me, because he'd said all these unkind things about the land of my birth through the years, you know. So uh, I did go back with him. He said, I think you should go. and. Uh, it was wonderful. We went to the first of all. We visited our Chinese son's uh, family in Taiwan, and that was a lovely experience too. And his mother always called us Chiang's two mothers, and we have pictures of us with them. Then we went to the Philippines, and we were there about a week. Then we went to Korea, and we were there two weeks. Oh. It was wonderful. And you had been away for 20 years, probably? At least, been, perhaps been more than that, because the war, the Korean War, had taken place. And when I first drove in, somebody met us with a car, and we drove to the hotel. And I didn't recognize anything. Well, it had been bombed. A lot of the land had been changed, the contours of the land. Even. What city would have been the most familiar to you? Seoul. Seoul. Mm -hmm. So you went yes, back I to Seoul? Yes, I went back to Seoul. We did visit some other schools there and other... Well, that was another trip when we visited other universities. We stayed in Seoul that trip. But was there anybody <coughs> left there that oh, you had yes. known? Mm -hmm. Oh, yes. Yes, there were some who had gone back as missionaries and uh, were still there, so people I had grown up with. And so I, there were some people still there. But I remember when you, we got to the hotel, I said, Vernon, I know where we are, and I know how to get back to the compound where we lived, so I want to go alone. And I did. I left him, and I went alone back. And there was a, my grandfather had founded the first medical school in the country, as well as the first modern hospital. He worked in a little sh shed, sort of, at first. I have pictures of him. Um, operating or teaching students how to operate in just a little dark place. And so I went to the hospital area first, and there wasn't any hospital there. There was a big bus station there. It had been bombed during the war. And the GIs had been treated by this hospital when they were fighting in the Korean War. And they gave the money to build a new one, but it was in a different location. So <coughs> I looked around. Even the ground had been, the land had been regraded, so it wasn't the same contour even as it had been. For, and I, I stood there all by myself and cried. I was oh, so disappointed. Gosh. And I thought to myself, I don't belong here anymore. And it was kind of where you came uh, to terms with it. And yes, it changed yes, so yes, yes. But it ended up being a good trip. Oh, right? it was wonderful, yes, because Vernon liked it. it and he met one. interesting Koreans, and he said the country was truly beautiful and that I had understated the facts. Oh, so, that so made you me feel very, very way. happy, yes. Yeah. Um, when <clears> you <throat> talked to people that were living there who had gone back to the missionaries, had everything changed or was it just the physical part of it changed? Were they, <sighs> did they still feel they were needed there? Yes, you know? I think so. I think so. The country needed more people and uh, they were there, I suppose, and could speak the language as Koreans. You know, there was no accent, the people uh -huh. that, were, that grew up there. Um, your grandfather has been honored yes. by, by the country. 
uh, on many different occasions. There's a statue in front of the medical school of my grandfather. Isn't that marvelous? What was his name? O.R. Avison. Oliver was his name, and he put in an R for it. There weren't many second names. He just put it in, he thought O oh, and R went together. So, But he was a medical. Operating <laughs> room, Abbott Avison. He was born in England and did his medical training at the University of Toronto and married a Canadian. And then the legacy of the Avisons in Korea began. Yes, yeah. yes. Our family is well Have known. you gone back again since Yes, then? we went back two times after that. And my daughter, uh, my, both my parents are buried there. And the Korea, yes, that's where they wanted to be buried. There is a Korean uh, proverb that if you aren't buried in the country in which you are born, your soul will wander around for eternity with no place to rest. And I don't really know if my father <laughs> believed that. I don't think he did. But somehow he wanted to be buried there. And then when my mother died years later, she also wanted to be buried there. And the Korean doctors had saved enough money to put a stone on their graves. And they wanted me and my sisters to go out for the ceremony they would have. Well, one of my sisters said, why don't we each send a daughter? And so four first cousins who had never seen each other before, uh, our daughter lived in Tallahassee, and then the next nearest to her was Toronto, and then Denver, and Vancouver Island. All these children had been born up in various parts of this continent and had never met. And when Lynn left, she said, I don't know how I'm going to recognize Mia. I've never seen her. Well, Mia was Mia standing in L.A. Uh, airport holding up a sign, I am Mia. <laughs> so that's how they got together. The other two got together in Vancouver. And there was a strong family resemblance, so they recognized. Between the four girls? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And they did go for the dedication. And they came back ecstatic. They were treated like royalty. They were The doctors took them to theaters and good Korean restaurants and so on. And they met some of the missionaries, too. And they, they just came back thrilled. So it was a wonderful It experience. was. It was. It was and wonderful. they got to know their cousins. That's too. right. And they're still good friends. They, they loved each other instantly. Isn't and they all decided they had pretty nice mothers. <laughs> <laughs> and so it was a very satisfying trip. And each time you've gone back, uh, you still feel like you're going to your roots. I call that my home. A good deal of the time I talk about going home when I'm going to Korea. How interesting. Uh, you have no family there now? No, although. no. Yeah. No. But it still is. Now, what nationality have you become? Or are you? I'm an American now. You became I, American. I became an American, and I'm mm -hmm. proud of that, too. When did you do that? Oh, let me see. I'd been here for some time, but it was very awkward having no uh, citizenship. And for, you have to be in the country. I had been here for five years. That's the limit. Uh -huh. You have to have so you lived in. The and, and Vernon had been at the University of Virginia for two years, so his came before mine. And it was. I was really thrilled to become an American. I was very happy. Georgia Tech had gotten in your blood by that time. <laughs> right. Yes. Right. You knew all the good things about Georgia Tech. I did. So it was time to be part of us, right? Mm -hmm. um, and then the Alumni Association had a good sense to make you an honorary alum. Oh, I was so thrilled. <laughs> <laughs> it was really wonderful. Mrs. Pettit and I were made honorary alums the first together. You were in good company. Yes. It was homecoming weekend. And it was really a very big honor. Um, when you think about the times that you had with Georgia Tech, what comes to your mind? What's your first Students recollection? come first. The students always came mm -hmm. first. Did you have mm -hmm. favorite students over the years? Oh, yes. Well, the ones we got to know best. Well, tell yeah. us a little bit about your firstborn son, your first your Chinese son. Our Chinese son. Well, he, Vernon met him. He was going to do graduate work in physics. So he, Vernon went down to the airport, not to the airport, to the bus station. He was coming in by bus and met him and showed him around the campus. And he showed him his um, post office box and how to work the uh, whatever you call it there. And uh, he came home that day and he said, I've met the most interesting young man today. I want you to meet him. Well, we had been concentrating on Oriental students anyway because of my background. When they needed some place to eat, they came to our house and that sort of thing. So I said, well, just tell him to come over. And pretty soon he was bringing friends over, and some Chinese friends. And then 
He came in after a year of being at Georgia Tech, and he said to Vernon, I've just come from the doctors, and he says, I have TB, and I want to take a quarter off to heal myself and uh, make myself better. And Vernon said, well, you won't do that. I have had TB, and you will not only not heal yourself, but you'll infect others. You must have medical attention. And he was very upset anyway when he came in, and to get that kind of response was not what he wanted. So he stomped out and said, I thought I was coming to speak to a friend, but speaking to the head of the physics department. And um, so he disappeared for six weeks. We didn't know where he was, and we came to realize that he had really become an important part of our family. And he came back very sheepishly after about six weeks and said he'd been in New Orleans, and a priest had befriended him and told him to go back and do whatever Dr. Crawford told him to do. <laughs> so he said, I'm ready to do that. Well, the first thing Vernon did was to put him under house arrest. He called the Georgia Tech security to take him over to the infirmary. He was afraid he'd run off again, you know. And uh, they confirmed the case. There was a TB hospital at the time. It was a hospital in Rome. Georgia strictly for tuberculosis cases, but it was for Georgia uh, citizens only. And so they weren't about to accept him. And I said, well, he contracted the disease in a Georgia institution. That should count for something. And they said, well, yes, but they would, they would take him, but they would not, they would charge us for his care. And I said, that's all right. We'll, we'll take care of it. Well, we had two children in college at the time, so I went to the Atlanta Lung Association and explained our dilemma. I said, I, we're willing to do it, but if we could get some help, it would be wonderful. Oh, Miss Crawford, that's the kind of case we just love to help. But don't tell anybody about it, because if you do, the hospital will hear and will charge more. Oh, and she said no, they would charge more if they knew you were getting help. So as they, what they said was, you tell us how much the hospital is charging. We'll send you a check. They never covered it all, but it was pretty close to it. And uh, put it in your, we'll send it and put it in your account, and then you write a check to them, and then they won't charge extra for it. And so that's what we did. And this again was for, tell us his name again. His, his name was C.S. Kyung, and at that time he had an American name, which he eschews now. He wants to be called by his Chinese name. And we, everybody asks him what C.S. stands for, and it's Chao Tzu, but in recent years he's been saying it stands for Crawford's son. <laughs> oh, isn't that a nice compliment? Mm -hmm. Yes, you. yes. And how long did he have to stay in the hospital? Only six months. So they got it early. Well. Mm -hmm. He did very well, but he had to uh, continue on drugs for a long time. After he, and he was not allowed to go back to the kind of life he was leading. He was, it sounds like he was a <laughs> reprobate or something. He wasn't, but he was very interested in the social problems in the South at that time. And uh, he would go out to Stone Mountain to Ku Klux Klan rallies, you know, and then the police would take his picture out there, things like that. So he was doing, he would hitchhike. He was doing a lot of field research. He was, and he was representing Southeast United States at a paper in Taiwan, and he wanted to get stories that were human interest stories. Uh -huh. And uh, he would he hitchhike had... and get onto a, a uh, some kind of a truck and learn the story of the truck driver. And it was made for interesting stories that he wrote back home. So he, he's a man of many hats. He is. Not, he is. not unlike his father figure, Dr. Crawford. <laughs> yes, he calls me mom, but he always called Burnham Dr. Crawford. Did he <laughs> so I was, mm -hmm. yes. That's wonderful. How, uh, and your relationship with him goes all the way back to then and has continued mm -hmm. all it's these years? continued. He um, brought his wife to be, Marilyn to see us one time, and her she was Jewish, and he was Chinese, and her parents were very unhappy about this. You know, they were Orthodox Jews, but anyway, they went ahead, and they were married in a friend's home, and they had asked a, ch a judge from North Georgia to perform the ceremony, and he had chosen all the sections of the New Testament that likened the marriage relationship to Christ and the church, oh, as a Buddhist <laughs> and a Jewish person, and it didn't mean a thing. I sat there and I had a hard time keeping from laughing out loud. It was so funny. <laughs> but anyway, they got married, and they have two very lovely girls, one who is in Shanghai now working, the older one, 
and the other one uh, graduated from Georgia State. Another way that he emulates his father, Dr. Crawford, there. I uh, guess. Two daughters. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yes, right. Um, Dr. Crawford, for you to do that, to take someone in and pay their expenses and nurture them, that's an extraordinary thing to do. Well, it didn't seem so at the time. Uh, people had been good to us all along the way, and uh, you don't ever pay back the people who are kind to you. Pass you have to pass it on. And I, he was always feeling that he owed us so much, and I gave him that little kernel of philosophy, and he has practiced it ever since. He said, I know I can never thank you, but I can pass it on pass to others. On. So, And that's what makes the world worth being, mm -hmm. isn't it? Mm -hmm. Those rich things. Were, were there any other students that you were particularly fond of? Politically? Well, we got closer to student government uh, students as they came and went. Uh, but, uh, well, that class of 69, I think, is the, and the group of seven is probably the group we understood better. And they'd come over here just, you know, for breakfast sometimes, and sometimes they would. When they first asked me, could I have them for breakfast, I was appalled, because I'm not a morning person. <laughs> I'm not, I don't even smile in the morning. <laughs> but I thought I'd try it. And it turned out to be a lot better than an evening meal, because when they came at night, they spent the night with us almost at, at uh, morning. Everybody it was something. Sunday morning, and they would go after 12 sometimes, mm -hmm. leave. And so it turned out to be all right. And it was okay you learned to be a morning person? Well, I learned to smile even <laughs> if I didn't feel like it. I was such a bad morning person. Vernon finally got tired of my glaring at him, and so he brought me breakfast in bed every morning. Oh, how nice. For years. How nice. It was nice. What kind of impact did having all these students coming and going have on your, your daughters? How did they like being so much a part of all that? Well, they were not around really when we started entertaining them here. They were in, uh, at college when we started having them to this house. But uh, they, they just thought that's the way we were. They didn't accept, I mean, they didn't object at all. They didn't marry Georgia Tech men, did they? No. <laughs> One, they... Tell us about the girls. Uh, Lynn married a man who lived in Atlanta, and she had gone to college with him. And uh, he, they've been divorced since, which broke my heart, because he had started going with Lynn when they were in 10th grade. But she has managed very well. I'm proud of her. She lives in Tallahassee. Dell lives in Florida also. She lives down in Cape Coral, which is next to Fort Myers. It's really way down. And... <laughs> they both w were classmates at college and uh, got married the day that after they graduated, so they sort of followed my example. And um, she and her husband both have been teachers. Well, he's been a, a, a principal for a long time, and they hope to retire before long. She has become a poet that is published, and I'm very proud of oh, that. Wow, I, I really am. And do you have grandchildren? I'm going to be a great-grandmother. How about that? So you obviously have um, yes, I had my two granddaughters. Actually, the first one was was um, adopted, and Dell and Ron had been trying for a long time to have a family. And finally, the doctor said, "You probably never will have children of your own because you both had problems. So, if you want a family while you're young, you should start the uh, adoption proceedings because sometimes it takes a long time. It didn't take a long time; it took something like five months." And when they got this darling little red-headed baby, she was only five days old, Del was pregnant and didn't know it. And those two girls are eight months apart. Oh, how exciting. <laughs> and they're more like twins. They just love each other dearly. Oh, and uh, Haley was married a month after she got married. She was a sorority girl, and he was a fraternity man. And uh, they got married and had a very lavish, wonderful wedding. We, we were very proud of them. It was beautiful wedding. And they had decided before they got married that his salary and job would take precedence over hers, which she started to climb faster than he did. So she said to him one day, I think it's time we started a family. This is her way of handling it. So they did, and um, I'll be a great grandmother in July. How exciting. <laughs> I am really, really pleased. And the other girl, uh, graduated the next year, of course, and 
she thought she was going to be married right away. Uh, Haley said that Cheney thought she ought to do exactly the same things that she had done. And she called me one time, she said, Granny, I want you to meet Steve. And I'd never heard of Steve before. So she and Steve, I said, I told Vernon, and he was in bed. And he said, I don't think I can manage that. He was quite sick then. So I called her back and left a message on her machine. Your grandfather really can't take any company right now. Well, she called back the next morning, and the, he had a cordless phone on the bed, so he answered. And she said, Grampy, we're not going to stay with you. We won't wear you out. <laughs> and she said, Steve is going to stay with a Georgia Tech friend, and I'm going to stay in a motel. So we'll be busy, and, and we're not going to wear you out. But she said, I want him to meet you, because I told him you were the cutest couple I know. <laughs> so what would he say? <laughs> Except, well, come along. So they did, and I tried to keep them busy, and so on. And, I wasn't really, I liked Steve and I couldn't put my finger on anything that was wrong, but I just didn't think it was a good fit. And, uh, but I didn't say anything about it. And Vernon would say, there's nothing wrong with him. And I'd say, I know. He had graduated some years before and was making a good salary, had everything going for him. Uh, but anyway, the night before she graduated from FSU, uh, one of our rivals, um, uh, she stood up and she said, everyone, I have an announcement to make. Steve is no more. And I said, well, better now than later, Shaney. And, uh, and I don't know what happened. Grandmother's I, intuition, though. Might have been. Her dad felt the same way, I found out later. And uh, so. So we still have her adventure. Ahead she, of yes, she is a nutritionist. And for a while, she uh, worked with indigent families in Fort Myers, mostly Spanish-speaking, and she has an ear for languages. So she, she wanted to be a, an actress, and she majored in theater for the first two years. And she began to think she might be a little bit hungry looking for jobs, <laughs> and that it wasn't a practical area to major in. And we were terribly disappointed because I guess we were prejudiced, but we thought she had lots of talent. She could sing. Well, and, and you'd have such a, a, a love of the theater. Yes, yes, nice. we do. It would have been nice. But anyway, she went to her minor, and it took her a little longer because there were so many chemistries she had to take. Um, <clears throat> one of the other things that Dr. Crawford had a great interest in was the literacy right. programs. Tell us a little bit how you got involved with that. Well. We started, with, I don't remember the name of the founder of Literacy Action, which is still going strong in Atlanta. But anyway, uh, at that time there was a great cry from uh, working people at various places. And we had a requirement, I mean, we were asked to teach people at Georgia Tech in the kitchen and janitors and things like that. Individual tutor. Individual programs. teacher. That's what oh. this group was. Uh -huh. It was individual, one on one, and they used the Laubach method, which we all had to take uh, to, before we taught. But I had taught first grade, so this was a, a big boon to me, and I'd never taught adults before. But I chose a cook at Georgia Tech because she was the same age I was, and we've been good friends ever since. She has had poor health, but she still writes to me, remembers my birthday, and sends me Christmas cards. And uh, so that's how it all started. Vernon taught other people at Tech. And I guess that when my student graduated, he was, uh, let's see, vice president for academic affairs. Anyway, he held a little graduation ceremony in his office for those who had gone through the program. Mm. A certain number of books in the Laubach method was uh, what they had to do. And I had given her, she had changed after I t uh, started teaching her, she was as homely as sin. She had uh, very stringy hair, which she wore with a little knot on top, and no teeth but one tooth in the front of her mouth, and grossly overweight. And after we got going, she got herself a wig, she got a whole set of new teeth, and she lost weight. And but, I don't know, she just felt better about herself, I think. She didn't even know what Southwest meant. She had a Southwest address, and she didn't know what that meant. So it was, she could give me the reasons for teaching her things. Mm -hmm. So you the, opened up a whole new world. Yes, and she lives in the Southwest section up here. Mm -hmm. But anyway, that's how we started. <clears throat> and then Literacy Action Administration was teaching at the old uh, 
Rich's Starfer Homes, for long, after the Starfer Homes moved out for a long time, and Vernon would go down there, and I would go down there to get materials and so on. And I don't know why I stopped with that, but anyway, then uh, the Literate Community Program came out all over Georgia, and these were communities that knew they had a lot of illiterates in them, and they wanted to change that picture. And so uh, they organized, and it takes about 10 years for any town in Georgia to achieve the place where they can put up on their water tower or the entrance to town, Griffin, a literate community. And it, it, there are all kinds of uh, reasons for, I mean, uh, rules criteria. that have to be met, criteria that have to be met mm -hmm. to do this. And none of them has achieved it yet, but Vernon told him he would be back, maybe he will in spirit, when they had reached that, uh, that point. point in their learning. And it will happen. I think it will happen. Mm -hmm. uh, we have a scholarship together. It's called the Helen and Vernon Scholarship. It's for students who commit, I mean, who go through the, the literate community program and get their GEDs. They can do that also and want to go to a post-secondary school. It's usually technical work. They want to learn something like that. And we give them $100 each semester. We don't try to give them the whole thing. And they have to apply for it, too, and, and be recommended. By them. There must be some good uh, hope for their succeeding. Is this through the state of Georgia? Yeah, it's all over Georgia. So they can go to any school? In the any state. school. Mm -hmm. What a, a wonderful program. It, uh, it goes from Albany right up to, oh, what is the place that used to, Fort Oglethorpe or something like It's up in the northern part. As of far the as you can get. <laughs> as far as you can get. And there are lots of those programs going on. Um, we take literacy for granted. Some people yes. just don't realize how many people have not learned those basic skills. And the ones we've met who have gone through the program have been so interesting. There was a man up in the northern part of Georgia who had had an accident. Glass had blown into his eyes and face when he was a young man, so he'd never learned to read. But his children had all learned to read, and he was feeling more and more like he didn't belong in our society, and he wanted to. He had since had some surgery and his eyesight had come back. He always wore a cowboy hat, you know, and he had more stories that he could tell, but he couldn't write them down. Now he's writing his stories down. How wonderful. And uh, he stood up one time in one of the annual meetings they have in Atlanta and told his story about what it had meant to him. He even built himself a little study. He was ashamed for his children to see him studying for this. How wonderful. It really it really was. So it's a great gift to the community mm -hmm. to help these people. Mm -hmm. um, you have had a very rich life. I have, and I'm very grateful to so many people that have made it to come true. When you think back mm -hmm. over uh, your story, are there anything, other little anecdotes that you want to add to this? Um, well, if I thought about it, I probably <laughs> could. Uh, bring the important. We've talked about the importance of your roots of mm -hmm. Korea being still. Um, you weren't going to go back there anymore. Not to live. No, I don't think I want to go back anymore. Maybe my children will want to. We don't want Or to grandchildren. <laughs> no. We don't want you to go. I'm at home here. Stay here. This yeah. is where I want to stay, and I want to stay close to Dad. And do you have close <coughs> ties still in, in Canada? Still, yes, still yes. You see, Vernon uh, has family there, cousins, and a brother who is in the same town that we went to college. And... Um, my sisters, I have one, two, three, three sisters living in Canada, and they... Well, that's not so far. We'll let you go back. Oh, well, I do. Canada. I do go yeah. for... I'm, and there's a reunion every summer on the West Coast of young people who grew up with us. Well, they're not young people now. They're all white-haired and grandparents, <laughs> but... Um, they, uh, it stretches from San Diego all the way up the West Coast to Vancouver, and they take turns meeting uh, at different places. And last summer, I went to one of these reunions. I'd never been to one, and there were people there I hadn't seen for over 50 years. Was it fun? It, it was wonderful. It really was. So you'll still stay in touch with all your Canadian oh, yes. neighbors? Oh, mm -hmm. yes. I have. Um, what, what other things uh, are important to you now, Helen? You're, do you still stay in touch with the culture of life here at Georgia, at Georgia <coughs> Tech, certainly, in mm -hmm. the community, too? Well, I, I do want to stay close to Georgia Tech, and the Georgia Tech Women's Club 
that is a great bunch of people from all over the country and all over the world, really. And um, <clears throat> that is my base interest, I think, that I, I really have loved my time with that. I also am very interested in the United Nations. I was president one time, the Atlanta branch. Uh, let me see what else. That's an active organization. Yeah, oh, Berg, we, yes, it is. There, I also belong to a great books group that Vernon and I started in about, oh, about 30 years ago. We were found we were doing things apart. We weren't doing things together, so we chose that. And I really loved that. And we always had led meetings together, so I was a little reluctant about doing it by myself. And last year I was on the committee. What they do is they, we've been members of great books for so long that the readings that are sent to us from Chicago are repetitious sometimes. Then they're done that. They, we've done that one. <laughs> And I don't mind doing them over again, but um, some people do. So we choose the ones we're going to read in the great books uh, selections that are sent to us. And then we have a committee that decides on readings that are more contemporary. Alternates. And this year we're doing um, Nobel Prize winners oh, how as well. As, and so that's been fun. Mm -hmm. Helen, you're wearing your trademark earrings. Yes. And, and these are showing. Uh, tell us about those. Where did they come from and what do they mean? Well, they mean happiness. I bought a pair just exactly this uh, size and uh, same symbol at Rich's for one dollar many years ago. And of course, one of them broke and uh, it was only zinc. They said it wasn't worth repairing. So one day, Dr. Walter Bloom was in the vice uh, president's office at that time. He is a medical man. But he was, he believes in changing your career every 10 years, and so he was at Georgia Tech at that time. And he said to Vernon one day, is there anything in the jewelry line that Helen would like? Because I had worn this other pair every day, too. And Vernon said, as a matter of fact, there is. And so he took my broken earrings to Dr. Bloom, and he copied them in gold and gave them to me. He said, I've taken up jewelry making as a hobby, and I just love to do something for Helen. So. There's, I have a drawer full of jewelry, but I don't wear it very often because I... And when we were in Taiwan, uh, no, we were in Bangkok not long ago, Thailand, because it was in another city from Bangkok, I found silver ones with the same symbol, so when I'm wearing silver jewelry... Well, know, how nice you can there's, They're much bigger than these, but it's the same symbol, so I only wear them at night. But Did you learn to write <coughs> Korean when you were in Korean? No, and that was the big mistake that I didn't do and my parents didn't require it because I think that contributed to my losing the language. But I was in Wright's uh, floor shop the other day and I thought that uh, the woman serving me was Korean so I asked her and she said yes and I said I am too. And she said, oh, you must speak Korean. And so I told her in Korean, no, I, I'd forgotten how. She says, your accent is better than my daughter's. Her daughter had grown up in Atlanta. So there is an accent. There is an accent. And another time I was there, and I was able to use a little Korean in talking to her, which, well, I had that time, too. I'd said, no, I've forgotten it all. But uh, I think it's in my... It subconscious. Comes, it comes and goes. Mm -hmm. it comes and, goes. and I used to dream in Korean, and then I'd wake up and I couldn't remember what I'd said. But you knew you had dreamed in a Korean. Yes. Um, you showed us the scroll, and I'm going to have that. Yeah, there it is. Uh, it's very old, and the young man who sent it to me was, like me, a third generation to Korea. And he had been given a Korean chest full of treasures. Wait, oh, excuse me. Well, anyway, this has Chinese characters. Any educated Oriental learns Chinese characters. It doesn't matter oh. where they are. They say it differently, but they and there are thousands of Chinese characters. They're on basic. Read us what it says on the back. All right. I better put on my glasses for that. Is this <coughs> well, I, I, I asked uh, Kenneth Kiang to translate it for him. It's just the same as this, except instead of Emperor Yo, he said Emperor Yi, so I think that sounds more like it. It said, um, in commemoration of the doctor, is what it said and first. Referring to your grandfather. Referring to my grandfather. As for his skill in the use of medicine, it is equal to that of Muhan, who was the first in all the universe 
in the days of the Emperor Yo, 8,480 odd years ago. So, what, a, what an honor yes. to have it. So this is well, I don't know really uh, whether I'll keep it because I think well, uh, keep it for a while. For a while yeah. The and university then, of which he was president would like to have it. And, uh -huh. and they would have the conditions in a museum for preserving it much preserve better it. than I would have yeah. here. So I think that I shouldn't be too selfish. But I, one of my sisters was here this last week, one from Toronto. So and she thought, yes, and she thought that was what we should do with it. Yeah. But, uh, you but have, your, your home is lovely. You're full of treasures of your... <laughs> of your Georgia <laughs> Tech is well represented, too. <laughs> the two loves of your life. Yes. Korea and Georgia um, Tech. Vernon has um, cups and things that students have given him, which I think should go back to the student union. There's the one honoring him for being the outstanding um, administrator. And then there was another one. It was called uh, the George Griffin Award for having interest in the students. Now that we're bringing up George Griffin, I have to ask you if you have a George story. Was George Griffin a, an acquaintance? Everybody did. <laughs> Vernon would have some, but I know his wife was just as interesting as he. Oh, tell and us that about She was her. very literate. She could quote poems, full lengths of long poems. She was an outstanding person. They were famous. This is a George Griffin story for being forgetful, both of them. Oh, and both of them? <clears throat> yes. And so one day George came home and uh, his wife, said, Jeannie, said, George, I want you to go out and mail these invitations. It's for two weeks from tonight. So we're going to have a dinner party. So <clears throat> George went upstairs and put his invitations in a drawer. Two weeks later, he came home, and Jeannie was setting the table. And he said, are we having company? She said, you know, George, all those invitations you mailed a few days ago. And he, he remembered then. And so he went upstairs and he got out the invitations. And he went. He said, I'll be right back, Jean Jeannie. I won't take long. So he called every one of those people who had, were supposed to have been invited. And some of them said, well, George, we've already eaten. Or we have other. I don't care. You've got to come. <laughs> so so <laughs> most of them did. They dropped all their other plans. But he, they were really a funny couple. And darlings. Just just darlings. I remember one time I drove Jeannie and two other ladies of her same age over to West Georgia College. A friend that we had there had been at Tech. And they were, it was just delightful listening to those women talk, not only about memories of Tech, but they would quote this poems and things. They were just delightful. Of course, they always wanted me to go east when I was supposed to be going west and things. And <laughs> no sense of direction. No, no, well. <laughs> I had never heard that she was uh, anything about her. Rarely do we yeah. hear talk of her, only that she was a, a wonderful She was a terrible wife. driver. Oh. And, you know, you took your life in your hands if you let her drive you anyplace. For one thing, she was very tiny. And you know how old people they get, so they sink Sitting into their in seats. Yeah. And that. <laughs> so she was sinking into her seat. You couldn't see and she, she talked was all the time. <laughs> she was a great talker. George was a great talker, too. And you, he was bad. They finally took his license away from him. He had too many accidents. Oh, but my. but he was loved by everybody, and so was she. And that they made an impact on you. Yes, they did. <clears throat> yes, they did. Yeah. That uh, great character. I was glad that I got to know them both. Well, Georgia Tech is full of lots of traditions. Yes. Uh, and Helen and Vernon Crawford are becoming part of that tradition. Well, that's awfully nice Great to hear. The fondness uh, that everyone has for the many contributions you've made for to us there. Um, and someday we'll be doing interviews with someone who will be telling us the Helen Crawford story <laughs> and what she was <laughs> like. And how would you like them to describe you, Helen? Well, my love for Georgia Tech would be... <coughs> Uh, at the top of the list, I think, uh, most important part of uh, our life has been there. I have now grown, well, you're talk you asked about Georgia Tech specifically. I, I have very fond memories of our contact with students, and I'm trying to keep that up. I was honored by students twice. I'm a life member of ERT and I still go to ERT meetings. You notice the red car out there. I would never buy a red car. That's a, a car uh, that I'm renting because I had an accident going to an ERT breakfast 
a couple of weeks ago. <coughs> I, got, well, I was running a little late, and so I cut through the campus to come out on North Avenue. And I turned to look for the traffic on my left and looked full into that bright sun and was blinded. I didn't see anything. I turned this way, and I was still blind, and I didn't see anything coming this way. And I, I did, wasn't going fast, but I started out and ran smack into a Saab car and buckled the door. Well, this was a young mother taking her baby to a nursery before she went to work. The baby slipped through all of it. Nobody oh, was hurt, oh, thank, thank goodness. goodness. And I told her, this is my fault and my insurance will take care of it. She called a policeman. <clears throat> and uh, by the time we went through the policeman and so on, uh, it, I didn't you feel in the mood it. to go you to breakfast. The breakfast. <laughs> and I was very sorry, but I just wasn't in the mood at that point, And my car was pretty well bashed up. It's going to cost three thousand dollars to fix it. My, my, my. <laughs> but my insurance will take on but two hundred and fifty dollars. You must try my elevator while you're here. That's my newest acquisition. About my grandsons too, because it looks like I've left them out and I love them dearly. One is a graduate of a small uh, college in the university system of Florida, and I can't remember the name of that school, but it was in um, Tal not Tallahassee the arm that goes across the, what do they call that? Pensacola. The is Pensacola. It, it was in Pensacola. Yeah. And uh, the other one has started his college career at Emory, at Emory at Oxford this year, but he will be transferring in a couple of years. So he'll be close at hand. Yes. I told Blake, the younger one, that I was new that he was going to be here, and I was so excited about it, but I was not going to be a pest. I was not going to call <laughs> him and bother him, but if he needed me or wanted me or wanted to bring a friend out for supper or something like that, he was to call first. And he started last September. He hasn't called me yet, uh -oh. which is good news. He's having a, the time of his life. He's, I've seen him. His mother's come up to visit him, and uh, we've gone out together and so, so he's on. doing fine he's doing fine and he's not finding the courses as challenging as he expected to he oh. he was always a good student he expects everything to be more difficult than it is yeah. for and the older grandson's <coughs> name is is Jonathan and Jonathan wants more than anything else to be a um, furniture craftsman and he is very good with wood he's made his mother's garage into a workshop and he collects tools all oh. the time uh, I had given Vernon a, uh, an Oxford unabridged dictionary, the 15 volumes in one volume, for Christmas, and I had nowhere to put it. So Jonathan made a stand for it, and it's very well crafted. But he knows he needs to learn more techniques. In the meantime, he's doing odd jobs, earning enough money to pay for this. He graduated from college, and that's when his education money stopped from his father. And uh, he is a very interesting young man. I, I hope he gets to realize his dream and that he will be a furniture craftsman. How wonderful. Helen, <coughs> it, it, as we sit here in your living room and we look around at your many, many treasures, the, the Buddha, especially over your shoulder here, is, uh, is so apparent to us. Uh, tell us a little bit about the influence. We I actually saw that Buddha a long time before I got up <laughs> to buy it. But I, I really liked it. There's such a serene look about Buddha's faces, usually, that uh, was something I grew up with, and it would enhance all the other uh, things from the Orient that I have around me. So I bought it, and Vernon objected immediately. He said that it, it uh, bothered his religious sensibilities, and so I had to put it in the attic for a while. And my mother came to visit me, and I said, Mother, I have a Buddha that I just love, and it's up in the attic. She said, let me see it. And she loved it, too. She had uh, lived out there. So I said, Vernon, Mother likes that Buddha. How about letting me have it downstairs for a while? Anyway, and he got used to it, and so it's, it's been downstairs ever since. But I have very fond memories of trips we used to take. I belonged to a class that was called Oriental History and, um, oh, I can't remember the other part, but anyway, it was an Oriental history. It was mostly a history of Korea, which goes way back 5,000 years or something like that, uh, B.C. And uh, <clears throat> anyway, we used to take field trips in connection with this class, and we always stayed at a Buddhist monastery. They would have one big room for 
pilgrims coming through the mountains. And we would be the pilgrims for a night, you know, and stay. And we, boys and girls, we all slept in one big room on the floor. And it, uh, it was just one of my very strong memories of the things that we did out there. They were almost like hostels then? Yes, yes. Any a person going through who needed a place to sleep was welcome to stay at a Buddhist monastery. Gracious hospitality. It was gracious hospitality. There was one story that I, about Buddhism that I remember. We were in an area in the north where no one can go now because the country is divided. And um, <coughs> we used to go up into the Diamond Mountains. That's this area. Beautiful scenery, the most beautiful in the country, the highest peaks and lots of waterfalls and pools, and a retreat for Buddhists who had little tiny uh, uh, monasteries all over the area, and also had original texts, for, uh, Buddhist texts that were hidden there. Anyway, one day we were walking through this area and we saw a little tiny uh, monastery that jutted out over the mountain. And it was supported by one long pole of several trees put together. And uh, so we decided we'd see what was inside. We scaled the mountain, got up there, and there was one little priest inside there counting his beads. Nami Ami Nami Ami So there was room for just one of us to go in at a time, but he beckoned us to come in. Then each one of us, you couldn't really see from where you were outside what was going on. He said, you see that floor down there? It was fall, and the leaves were gorgeous down in the valley. So we'd all look, and yes, we he made us get right down on our hands and knees with our heads touching the floor. And it was very beautiful, but he said when we got up, now you have just bowed to the Buddha, so you will have a long life and many good things happening to you. So that's how he tricked us into bowing to a Buddha. But he was right. He was right. Was he was things. right. Yes, yes, yes. And this was when you were a child. I was in high school about that time. Very yes. Young. Uh -huh. Very young. Mm -hmm. So you you have many good memories. Of I do. I remember we used to we had an old boat we called a smoothie, <laughs> and it really wasn't a very good boat. But my father loved it, and we all were able to sail it and go out on trips. And one time he wanted to go from where we went in the summertime, which was called Kumipo, around through the ocean up to the, uh, the Han River, which his soul was on the Han River. But he was afraid to do it alone with this unreliable craft. So uh, there was a Frenchman who had a very nice boat, and he would leave later than we and meet us on a particular island. So there we were waiting for him. And then a Japanese policeman came down and said, your friend Claude Plaisant has had engine trouble, and he can't come to meet you here. They want you to go back. Well, this was evening, and but it was nice. They checked up. Japanese police checked on you everywhere you went. Yeah, Korea was taken over, you know, by the Japanese. <coughs> and they would meet you at the station and ask you where you were going. Somebody met you at the other end to make sure you had told the truth. And so on. It, it got more unpleasant after I left. They used to scare you with bayonets when you went to the wrong place sometimes. My, and my sisters experienced that. But anyway, so... There we were, sitting on this little beach, and a Korean man came down and said, there's a Japanese man in our village who has a foreign bed, and your two daughters can sleep on that. So we went up, and there's no place to put a foreign bed but in the middle of the road. <coughs> so the whole village came out to see us turn in. In a bed in the middle of the road? Right. Oh, right. how funny. And where they put my father was under a chicken roost, which didn't, wasn't very conducive to sound sleep. But the next day we started back, and they had had a storm overnight at the beach where my mother was, and they'd had prayer meetings for us and all kinds of things because they were sure that we they'd never we see us again. Lost at sea, and mm -hmm. here you were. Right. Yes. Again. Your stories have been wonderful, Helen. We so enjoyed your company and and uh, the, your gracious offer to drive us and give us a ride in your wonderful new <laughs> elevator, which is lots of fun. Um, Overall, as, as we started to say before, you made a great impact on Georgia Tech, certainly with the students. Uh, I think if you want to go again, you told us off camera that your favorite awards were the ANAC and the... The ODK. ODK. And, and, and ERT. Yeah, all student organizations. Yes. Mm -hmm. um, um, and so I am an alumna. Oh, now of too. Course. I'm proud of that, yes, too. Yes, you are. Yes, indeed. Um,
And you will be remembered always as a great friend of the students, a great friend of Georgia Tech. Your loss uh, with Vernon's passing was one that was shared by so many of us, mm -hmm. but oh, so much more deeply by you. Uh, and yet you independently carry on met, met much of the work he started. We uh -huh. did things together, and so I'm trying to do the same things that we did together then. One wonderful thing that happened when he was so sick was that I was able to keep him at home. He did not want to go to a hospital, and we had hospice come in for the last three weeks. But it gave, it was the best time of our marriage because we faced up to what lay ahead and made plans for the kind of service we wanted. We wanted it at Georgia Tech, and he named the people he wanted to have speak at that service. And one of them was from the group of seven. He came back. He lives in Massachusetts, and he said to me when I called him, Ms. Crawford, I'm going to come on an early plane so there won't be any chance of my being late. And he did uh, give a very moving one. There were two students. Maybe some of you know Missy. Oh, she still comes to ERT. She was Missy Dean, and now yes. she's Hugen something. She was a presidential scholar. Yes, I mean, yes. She, yeah. And she spoke, and there was, a, first of all, a representative of the Board of Regents. He was um, the chairman of that group one year. And then there was um, one of the presidents, the one from Valdosta, represented the presidents. And then there was Dr. Valk from physics. Uh, let's see. And these were things that you chose together. Mm -hmm. We chose them together, and all the people I asked could do it. How we, we couldn't get tech so soon as, as maybe would have been nice, but it gave me time to do this. That he died in September, and the service was October 30th, but it gave us time to. And he died with my arms around him, and I'll never forget how blessed I felt about that. That's a great privilege. And I really drive a car with a GT12 on the license well, plate, which is his car. And that car is not mine, not <laughs> so yet. don't hold it against me. There's a red car there. <laughs> when we think of uh, Dr. Crawford, we wish, of course, that he could have given us an oral history. But you have done such a good job of, of giving us an insight into his thoughts and to uh, how he moved uh, and influenced so many people. And we thank you so much for sharing you're Dr. Crawford. You're so Crawford welcome. With us it's been yourself. fun. It's the been Helen fun. Crawford story is wonderful. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah.